Hey, Brass, I just aggressively yawned stretch about 30 minutes ago and now I can't move my neck. Facts here. The mall C1. The mall has been out for five plus years. At least I think it has, don't, don't actually look that up. Everyone that already matters has reviewed it and most customers have already made up their mind on it. It's 3,600 bucks, which means it's either the greatest laser aiming module of all time, because of course it is, it's 3,600 bucks. Why wouldn't it be? Or you look at that price tag and you're like, wow, that's stupid. That second camp, honestly, at first glance, might be onto something. Go check out this video right here. Shorthand, the D2 has the same downrange performance, roughly access to the same level of both spill and focus, the same weight, the same rough bulk as the mall, and yet cost about 1400 bucks if you can buy it for sub-map, which happens surprisingly often with this thing. Alternatively, for 3600 bucks, you can buy two gray market pack 15s. So today, despite all that, I'm going to tell you why you should buy a mall. I'm just kidding. While this thing is growing on me as my favorite laser aiming module on the market presently, I've been using this guy for about six months through multiple rucks, CQB, mountain shoots, regular flat range shoot. I can't actually tell you with a straight face, most of you are even going to get close to $3,600 worth of value out of it. But today I'll go over why I think for some people, $3,600 may in fact be justified, or at least as a curiosity on why the mall is currently the top contender for best laser aiming module on the market. If we forget money doesn't exist, but money totally exists, always exists, unless you have endless funds, but at that point you're so rich you might as well go buy an PMC instead. The short answer for those who are about to click off this video because they're starting to get bored is this lamb was designed from the ground up to be a modern laser aiming module. Long answer, well, buckle the fuck up. Make yourself a drink. No, I don't care it's midday on a Friday and you're at work. Try something like the Fuzzy Navel. Use the leftover OJ in the fridge and then put equal part schnapps in it. Yeah, pretty good. I didn't pay for this mall. For those that have been watching this channel for a long time, know that my first major set of sponsored videos was through Nightline and the mall was part of that payout. They were willing to give me a sponsorship back when no one else wanted to. Nightline is a night vision retailer. They're not some up and coming startup. They've been in the game for a very long time. In fact, most household names probably have Nightline as their middleman between L3 or Elbit. But Nightline is looking to dabble in the consumer space with some pretty damn good pricing. I mentioned it last time, but here we go again. If you use my 15% discount code, just let them know BrassFax sent you, or AssFax, you can get an upgraded PVS14 module with an Elbit tube for three grand. Look around, that's really hard to beat as prices are beginning to dial up. It does mean you need to pick up the phone though, but really night vision costs as much as a used car, so maybe that's a good thing. Anyways, go check out Nightline, on with the video. Raise it, oh shit, here it comes! <laughs> Chris, look at it, it's coming! It's coming! <laughs> Let me focus. Dude, that, that's not even real, that's just Project Blue Beam. Dude, that car is fucking obnoxious. Meh. Oh, that just traced a nasty line in the tube. <laughs> hey, there's a shooting star next to Starlink! Okay, let's get into theory. Laser theory. All laser aiming modules, I'm just gonna call them lambs from here on out, use the same PEX style military configuration, which is older than the majority of this audience. That also includes the two newcomers, the Engel and the Raid XE, which do support some modern features, including a literal Tamagotchi screen, but also still entirely mimic the layout and design of a peck box. Much of the design principles of these lasers seem to be centered around slow arm time, clunky selector dials, safety lockouts, and probably the assumption that these things are gonna be turned on and left on. It is understandable in the context of issuing this to private first class who gives a fuck 15 years ago, who are concerns of accidental LASIK, failed light discipline, rate at a similar level to probably actually just using this thing for real. Seriously, go look at the back of this A2. It feels like I'm arming an AIM-9X in a flight sim. Despite this clunky, complex buttonology, you actually still only end up with two usable modes under night vision. Laser Illume High, Laser Illume Low, with zero granularity. This lack of illuminator granularity between 100% high power and 5% low power is probably one of the biggest issues I find with these old style laser aiming modules. Low power eye safe settings work really well within about 30 yards or so and the full power setting really works well once you get to about 120 yards or so, depending on the lighting. Since you watch Brass Facts, I know your math isn't your strong suit, but heads up, 30 yards, 120 yards, there's a pretty big gap there. We can mitigate this by diffusing our highest setting to decrease the sensitivity downrange via a focusing dial, but those focusing dials range from glacially slow, like on the PEX front focus, which basically requires you to armpit the gun to reach it, and then it also tends to blind you when you do it because the illuminator is is the focus dial and then your hand goes, ah, oh, it sucks. 
At least with the D2, we can use a very easy to use diffuser cap, well, an aftermarket one, or use the RAID XE rear focusing dial, which can be adjusted with the fire control hand. But these are distinctly slow in the grand scheme of like a gunfight. Design-wise, laser aiming modules tend to ruin most firearms. Ergonomically, that is visually fucking cool as hell. The standard practice is to mount these things at 12 o'clock because my balance, my ergonomics, combine this with the tendency to put laser night vision equipment on shorter guns, we quickly find that our hand is being pushed further and further closer to the receiver. And instead of just dealing with that, uh, we get an entire cottage industry of parts that further ruin your gun at astronomical prices. Also, if you run an LPBO, there's about a 50% chance that you will cease to do so when you see the back of your laser aiming module in your optic on the 1X. As I said, you can train around this shit and many have, or sometimes you just kind of deal with it. And it's easy to brush off as many of these issues as, eh, I mean, that's the way it is. And honestly, night vision is already a force multiplier superpower. Shut up and use your $3,000 cat laser toy. So yeah, the mall looks at all of the above problems and made a novel design aimed at actually solving these. Seeing the ass end of your laser aiming box in your optic? Nope. The laser is now offset to the side, you can barely see it. Worried about 12 o'clock rail space? Well, the unit's original footprint has now been replaced by a built-in tape switch, saving a lot of space. Complex dial selector? Nope. Replaced with this propeller dial up front, which has off, viz, and IR. That's it. Super shrimple. Viz is almost universally always a utility thing from a civilian perspective, so you'll really, you're just gonna spin it all the way till it maxes out, and then you're just gonna leave it there. The same can be said technically about a PEC-15, but unlike a PEC-15, you're never really going to need to touch it again. With a PEC-15, you're going to need a bounce between low and high power potentially throughout the night, depending on what you're shooting. The room of magic, however, comes when we talk about the buttonology. That is a real word. We have the slider kind of forward of your thumb position for power level. Press all the way forward past this little safety detent thing. It gives you full chooch. Middle is probably your default position most of the time, and the rear position is the uh, this is fucking useless position. Uh, as for the tape switch itself, you get two big old circular buttons. The forward button is a tight cone, the rear button is spill. Unless you're in the rear useless power mode, but why would you? It's the useless power mode. That's a joke, it's not actually useless, but you're almost never gonna be in this mode like 95% of the time. And that's that's really about it, and that's, that's all this thing does. Wait, really? That's We're spending 2,500 bucks for a built-in tape switch and better buttons? Yeah, actually, more or less. But how these buttons play out and configured really solves a lot of our gripes with original PEC boxes. Obviously, we have the awesome, you know, out of the field of view, space efficient design, but more critically, we can rapidly, within sub-second intervals, go from flood, tight, low power, to high power. This speed means it's something we can actually do in between shots. Outside of the flat range where you have high contrast targets, it's actually comically easy, especially if you relocate positions to lose your downrange target. This is especially hilarious because I was the one that set up the targets in the first place. You see this happen all the time under darker kind of conditions. Relocate, say on a bounding drill, and then you watch a dude flail his illuminator all over the place trying to find this damn target. With them all, you get to your position, hit the flood, find the target, snap over to the focus beam, and do your thing. Also, that issue I mentioned earlier where you hit it with the focus beam and you find the target is so illuminated you lose all ability to actually see any details on target and can't even sometimes tell if you're, you know, off the target. Simply shift your finger back a tiny bit and boom, you now are on the flood mode, drastically reducing power levels on target or, you know, intensity. This little thing, this decision to bind one button to a flood and one button to a focus emitter, bypassing the need for a cumbersome focus dial, allowing us to switch back and forth, sometimes during recoil for the next shot to get the correct amount of illumination on target, makes a very big difference in certain lighting conditions against stationary targets. You throw in something that's actually moving, something that's trying really hard not to end up as a pasta strainer, hey, that seems pretty damn critical to me. The quality of life on this mall is so much better than any other base unit, and especially better than most civilian power units, aside from the D2, that my friends constantly want to run one of these. The really funny part zinger here is, uh, the mall is not even slightly ambidextrous, so you get the washroom suffer trying to use this thing. Mm, you can put a little taco behind it. Yeah, it's yeah, a little taco holder right here. <laughs> And the mall is not perfect by any means, right? It's kind of the first laser to kind of really step outside of this box in a serious manner. Full power slider, for example, on the civilian version feels really half-assed, likely because it's just recycled all of the designs from the 
full power version while not being full power. The end result is that the lockout slider for the full power makes a shitload of sense, right? You don't want to go to the full power mode most of the time because it can nuke eyeballs and that level of illumination is really only usable like 200 yards uh, and more. But on a limited civilian version, that power mode is regularly used all the time, even within 200 yards. So the, the, the safety block doesn't really make sense on the civilian model. Let, please let us remove the safety block. That, that shouldn't be there. Also, due to how the mall works, uh, there really isn't any way to leave this thing armed without experiencing vampiric drain. So you're, not, you're like for a home defense rifle, or you're not going to leave this in the viz laser mode on your nightstand. It'll chug through the batteries. I suspect there's a capacitor on board or a module that needs current when it's armed, as well as a small LED light that's constantly running when it's turned on, which God, I hate that thing. It's so bright. But in practice, Gucci SF operators will replace the battery every time they touch off, and you as a normal basic bitch that actually has to buy CR123s will just turn it off when not in use. Is it annoying? Yes, but it is what it is. I know some people have stated, at least previous versions, the propeller cap tends to, well, propeller off and tear off with debris or in extremely cold environments. Maybe it's because I have the newest iterations, but I haven't really found that to be the case, and I monkeyed on that thing in very cold environments, including a recent 10 degree overnight ruck with like obnoxious wind chills of 25 miles an hour or more. Another downside is probably, you know, just the weight and size of this thing. Yes, I know, I know, people keep saying it's very efficient with its space, but the reality is it's one of the heaviest units on the market and it's easily one of the largest units on the market. That's something we can deal with for night dedicated guns, but for those that find themselves using their gun as a primarily day option and the night vision component is more of an afterthought, a capability you have on the gun but not something you're really focused on, units like the Raid XE tend to just win out by virtue of being space efficient, by being, you know, half the size and almost half the weight. For most people, 2,500 bucks over the average lamb is stupid no matter how much in theory that price tag may or may not justify itself. And prepping is ultimately about maximizing dollar value. And even if this thing could actually give you literal sexual favors, the average user probably won't see much capability gain over say a D2 that I keep mentioning. But that doesn't mean there doesn't exist a market for this, both from the people that have money to burn on cloud items, or more importantly, those that seek out performance gain from this thing. And today I hope I showed you what that performance gain is and why I don't think in certain scenarios it's not insignificant at all. It's a big deal. Oh, almost knocked over my coffee. I'm gonna keep mine. Despite initially being pretty dead set on wanting to sell this thing after the review, I just find I love this functionality and it's now part of my muscle memory when I use night vision. And I'm distinctly kind of annoyed when I lose it when I go back to you know legacy style laser aiming modules and I really don't want to give that up. Anyways, yeah. Thanks for watching, thanks for Nightline for sponsoring this video, and thank you, the viewer, for commenting your deranged comments down in the comment section below. They're fun to read every morning while I drink my coffee and contemplate my existence. I'm writing the script basically in Jan 1st. You're gonna see this probably sometime in February, but uh, hey, what's up? Thanks for a great 2023, and here's to a, here's to a nice 2024. Hopefully. Maybe. I mean. The world feels like it's going to burn down, so who knows how nice it's going to be in theory. Uh, metaphorically, a nice 2024. Okay, bye. For a reason. Come here. Come here. Cover in those ears. Come here. No, I know, but you got to have them here. Yeah, I'm covered. Good girl. Yeah, huffy breath. I got you.